this space. So what I'm going to do for the next several minutes is give you a primer in the work that I do. What do I do specifically? Well, I work in industrial control system cybersecurity. And we'll talk about where industrial control systems or operational technology and process systems exist. But they are all around us. They surround us. And they are doing integral things to our society. They are making sure that we have clean water to drink. They are making sure that our transportation systems work. Vital things to our society all around the world. So what I'm going to be able to do today, which again is a huge honor to me, is give you a little course in where these systems are, how they function, and what can go wrong, and what the cybersecurity landscape around these systems, some of which are computers, really looks like. And as the wonderful introduction mentioned, thank you again, I do incident response in this space professionally. I have for some time, around 15 years. I have kind of an odd background in everything from aviation computers to manufacturing and electric grid computers, and how forensics and incident response and cybersecurity works in those non-standard devices. We'll talk a little bit about attacks that have happened in the past. Now, I don't want to go into like the huge discussion on Stuxnet. You all read. I, I have full faith in you. So we're not going to launch into a, a huge backstory into some of the more famous attacks. But what I want to talk about is what's potentially coming next, and where we need people, and why we need people in this space. And most importantly, the differences in what I do versus somebody doing traditional differ in enterprise environments does every day, so that you can make a judgment call about how that applies to your own work, and whether this is a space you or your mentees or your students might want to get into the, into the future. So first of all, I'm going to use some terminology, and I want to make sure that we're on the same page. So I'll talk a lot about a process. A process, as I refer to it in this talk, is a kinetic thing that is a procedure that's happening. So a physical thing that's happening in the real world. What could that look like? Well, it could be anything from generating electricity, to cooling a room, to building a widget to making a train go. So usually mechanical or physical things that are happening in the real world. They could be a lot of different things. Processes are complex, generally. They have to be controlled in some manner. We'll talk about what those control mechanisms can look like. But something has to make part A go to part B, go to part C, and so forth. Industrial control systems are a means to control a process, to make the A go to the B, go to the C, whether that's making a train go forward and stop, or it's making tuna get canned. I always use tuna canning as an example. I don't know why I'm so into tuna canning. I think it's fascinating. I think all these processes are fascinating. Every day of my work is an episode of how stuff works. So let's talk about these industrial control systems. Every industrial control system, again, something has to make the process flow. And that is what we term as a process control loop. Every control loop in these processes, again, these physical things that are happening, whether it's manufacturing, transportation, utilities, etc., has to have three components. Those three components are firstly an actuator. The actuator is the motor or the thing that causes a temperature change or a pressure change, a valve, et cetera. So something physical that's, that's being interacted with. You also have to have some kind of controller. Now, that controller doesn't have to be a computer. We'll talk about the different things that those, those controllers can be. But something, whether it's a person or a device, a computer, has to make decisions about when that actuator is going to do things. And finally, there has to be some type of sensor. Now, it can be my eyeballs, if it's a human being controlling the process, as it was through much of history. But something has to tell the, actu tell the controller that things are happening. If it's the tuna canning plant, that the can of tuna is ready to be filled, or the label it can be put on the can of tuna. We'll talk about another example here, though. So sensors, they can sense things like temperature, pressure, motion, or light. 
Here's a really easy example. Now, every time I get up and I use this example in front of an audience like this, I'm really worried that nobody's going to raise their hand. But let's just, just bear with me. We're going to give it a shot this morning. Who has gone through an automatic revolving door before? OK. I made it through another one. All right. A few of you have gone through an automatic revolving door. Excellent. All right, so this is a very simple process control loop, okay? So let's talk about these three components in your automatic revolving door. Now, when I research this, and I use this example a lot because it's really simple, I actually found out that a lot of people get injured by these doors every year. <laughs> it's a shocking number, actually, of people who get banged in the face by the doors and such, but usually nothing too serious. So let's talk about these three components. So first of all, the actuator, that's pretty simple. It's the motor that makes the door turn. So typically what's supposed to happen is you walk into the door and it senses you're there and it starts to move. So the actuator makes the motor turn and the door starts to turn. Now it has to have those other two components, right? So it has to have a, a uh, sensor to sense that you're in the door. So motion or some type of pressure sensor to, to know that somebody's in the door. But then you also have to have that controller making some simple decisions. This is simple computer logic. I have sensed that there's a person in the door, therefore I will issue a command to the actuator, which turns the motor, to start turning the door. It does some other things too though, right? It, it senses obstruction. And we all, we've all gotten into the door with our luggage and we've gotten a little too close to the sensor and then it jams in our face. And that's how people get their noses banged by the doors. But, um, so, so we can see those three components in this very, very, very simple process loop that we run into all the time when we're traveling, when we're doing business, et cetera. Let's think about the things that could go wrong in this process control loop. This is important to understand how every single process out there can potentially fail because there are only four failure states in process control loops. Let me tell you what they are. The first one is the actuator fails to start when it's supposed to. So what, what does that look like in our door? We get into the door, I got my luggage, the door isn't turning, it's kind of frustrating, maybe I push it, what, whatever I have to do to get through the door. So a little annoying with the door, not catastrophic. Second one, it fails to stop when it's supposed to. Okay, well the door's just banged into me, that's also kind of irritating, I'll probably be okay. Again, I mentioned people do get hurt by these doors. I, I've never been so frightened of these doors as, until I started reading into this. Third failure state, the door starts too early or too late. So then we've got a little delay or the door doesn't stop. You can see it's having an issue. And finally, the door goes on for the wrong period of time. Every single process control loop in every industrial space can have these four failure states. Now a door, again, people get bumps and bruises sometimes, but not typically a really big deal. But these process loops exist all over. In 1984, there was one of the most catastrophic industrial accidents, disasters of all time at the Bhopal India plant from Union, Union Carbide India. It was a confluence of catastrophes which caused a horrific accident, which there was um, over half a million people exposed to toxic chemicals and thousands died. One of the worst industrial catastrophes of all time. And again, it was a confluence of problems. Maintenance errors, human errors, people overriding safety systems, systems that were out of date and, you know, they were past their life. Industrial systems do very, very important things for society and sometimes they are involved in very dangerous processes. Our four failure states for a door, not that big of a deal, right? But for chemicals, for electricity, for smelting, things that are super hot, things that are super cold, high pressure things, things that can cause environmental contamination, those four failure states start becoming very, very, very serious. So as you start thinking about these other industrial processes that you, that you uh, are thinking about right now and that we'll mention during the course of this talk, start to think about those four failure states. What happens if the actuator goes on too late? What if it goes on for the wrong period of time? The consequences, and I use the word consequences a lot. 
if I, get, if, if I get one thing through your head today about industrial cybersecurity, I want you to go away with the word consequences. Because the consequences of things going wrong in industrial environments can be incredibly severe. We're talking about not just loss of money, we're talking about loss of life, environmental contamination, we're talking about injury, people losing limbs, really serious things, facilities catching on fire, equipment being catastrophically damaged. Consequences are key in this space of industrial cybersecurity. And we are surrounded by industrial control systems. We don't always think about them. In fact, in much of the world that the people in this audience live in, we're not used to many utilities failing. We are used to maybe the occasional power outage. So when I have conversations with people about industrial cybersecurity, where do they always go? They go, who's going to take out the power grid? Because that's what we're used to. We are very, very fortunate, very privileged, most of us, to live in places where we don't see our other utilities fail on a regular basis. We can typically turn on a faucet and get clean drinking water. That just works. We don't think about it because since the time we were children, for the most part, every time we wanted to flush a toilet, the toilet has flushed. Every time we've wanted a glass of water, we've been able to turn on the faucet. We think about the power going out because that's something we're familiar with. But we are surrounded by industrial control systems which are providing us our logistics and our modern conveniences. They are all around us. And that includes essential utilities, that includes our transportation, oil and gas, manufacturing. Again, it's not just electrical power. They are an essential part of our life and our safety as a society. And having those things fail or be disrupted or tampered with has real physical consequences in the real world. So let's talk about industrial control systems and where they came from. Okay, so I mentioned they don't have to be computers. And they weren't always. Industrial control systems, again, we're talking about those control loops, so something making decisions. They can be human, certainly. But if you want to automate industrial control, they can be mechanical. So it can just be gears, pulleys, weights, etc. and they were for a very long time. For a while, they were also analog, so very simple electric circuits. And many of them still are out there. But as we moved into the digital era, there were so many efficiencies to be gained by digitizing industrial control systems. We can make our process control loops much more complex, much more integrated and efficient. Now, the earliest industrial control systems, of course, were mechanical. So we even saw in 270 BCE a water clock in Egypt which was quite complex. And it was arguably a control system, a mechanical control system. The first furnace thermostat was developed in 1620, again, mechanical control system. But again, it was still controlling a control loop. It was still making decisions so a human didn't have to make decisions about what was happening in a process. The early industrial control systems that look like what we know of today were heavily focused on maritime, clocks, and trains, because those are things that needed to be efficient, they needed to be on time, they needed to be effective, and people needed to know that they would operate safely. Gears and weights provide a control instead of humans. So again, we've added efficiency. In the 20th century, we saw a great rise in mass production and manufacturing, also urbanization. We packed many more people into our cities. Aviation as well. So we start having aircraft, and they require precise timing, accurate measurements, etc. And therefore, we saw migration to analog, electronic control devices. So we've moved away from the mechanical, and now we're building circuits to make decisions about what our processes do. In the 50s, of course, there was the advent of computers. And people figured out fairly rapidly that those could be used to add even more efficiencies to industrial processes. The first digital industrial control system was used by Texaco in 1959. With the development of the transistor and smaller, cheaper electronics, though, there was a boom in digital control devices. By 1971, there were 41 manufacturers of indus digital industrial control systems out there. It was a rapid boom into the digital systems. 
And these systems, well, again, they, they, are, they are filling a function of telling devices what to do. They are generally programmed with simple ladder logic, which looks very much like electronic circuits. But again, we've added efficiencies. They are adaptable. We can change their programming. We don't have to build a new circuit. So we have much more customization available to us, and we can do things on grander scales for larger urban areas. So all of a sudden, we have a boom of digital industrial control systems. Now, there's still mechanical ones. There are still analog ones that are doing important things today. But we are surrounded today by many, many digital industrial control devices. And they're not just the door. The door is really simple. I use that example because we've all banged our face in a door and a revolving door, and we know what that looks like. But in a factory or a train, there's a bunch of control loops doing different things. In our tuna canning plant, we have like the conveyor belt, and we have the thing dumping the tuna into the cans, and we have to put labels on the cans, and there's heating involved. There's a bunch of different control loops, and they all have to work together because if they fall out of sync, really messy things happen with tuna that I don't want to think about. <laughs> So we have to have our digital control loops work together to be the most efficient and productive we can be. So we have to have some kind of synchronization of a bunch of different control devices in different control loops. And that's where we have SCADA and DCSs, or digi distributed control systems, come into play. First, we had DCSs, or distributed control systems, which could synchronize process loops across, say, a factory. But today, we also have SCADA in play in a lot of facilities, where we, we are talking about wide-scale optimization and synchronization of industrial control processes. We also see convergence of our IT technologies, the one that we see in our normal enterprise environments with these OT technologies, because it's cheaper. It's cheaper to go out and buy Cisco routers or Juniper routers than to build your own router for your industrial control system. It's cheaper to use Windows Embedded than to write your own operating system. It's more effective to maintain. So we've seen a great influx over the last 25 years of common computer vendors and technologies in these industrial devices. That doesn't mean at every level of the industrial devices there are still low-level actuators and sensors, but in terms of the computer systems making the decisions, showing the displays, providing control interfaces to operators, and providing communication for these systems, so network te networking technologies, et cetera, we're seeing much more use of common IT technologies. And what does that mean to us as cybersecurity people? It means that when things become typical computers, they are much more viable targets for attack of all kinds. So the first thing that we can really term as a cyber attack against an industrial control system occurred in Australia in 2000, where a disgruntled employee, yes, insiders are scary in industrial device networks because they know how to break things. A disgruntled employee who didn't get the job he wanted decided to dump a ton of sewage into a water reservoir. Um, and he did that because he knew the computer system and the transmission system that were utilized by the system. He had worked on them, and he knew, due to the lack of security in the system, that he could cause tremendous damage. We didn't talk about that a lot because there had always been insiders, and we knew that a disgruntled engineer could cause a lot of damage. We didn't think about it as being a cyber attack at the time, but it was. He was attacking a computer system. In 2007, Idaho National Laboratories in the United States decided to see what they could do using a cyber attack against a generator. If you've never watched the, the video of the Aurora generator tests that they conducted, you can find it on YouTube. I have a short clip here. But what they decided to do was essentially shake a generator to pieces using the control computer that was attached to it. And they were very effectively able to do this. It's, it's quite, quite visibly destroyed. And uh, it, it made waves, because this made mainstream news. It was like on CNN and things. And people really started to think about cyber attacks in a more sensational way against industrial control devices. And that opened the floodgates. Of course, again, I'm not going to get into a huge briefing on Stuxnet. I assume most of you have read about it, watch videos, watch movies. There's a lot of wonderful resources out there. But in 2010, a worm was discovered in an Iranian facility, nuclear facility. 
It's suspected development was er as early as 2005, and it effectively disrupted the Iranian nuclear program through centrifuge ta tampering, so very detailed tampering with very specific control devices used in that facility. There was, it was the first known cyber weapon, cyber weapon, purposeful cyber weapon developed to target industrial control systems, and it was highly complex. I mean, you could, you could tell by looking at this piece of malware that it was built by people who understood the facility, understood industrial control systems, and specifically had expertise in those very specialized industrial control devices. Most of us are familiar with the story of Stuxnet. It's been sensationalized in a lot of ways. Not every attack against industrial looks like this, but it is a pivotal moment in industrial control system cybersecurity. And it's something for us to keep in mind as a end of possibility, a, a, a extreme case of somebody building a very targeted cyber weapon to attack a specific facility in a very, very specialized way. In 2014, another rather shocking attack almost flew under the radar. And this was only discovered as a footnote in the annual report from the German government's agency doing the BSI, doing cybersecurity investigations. And they mentioned that there was a kinetically, physically damaging attack against a steel mill. Steel mills are really scary. Molten metal is very, very scary. High pressure molten metal, very, very scary. So in this case, we're talking about massive damage to a facility. This, that was the exact words they used, was massive damage against a steel facility caused by a cyber attack, which caused control system failures. This is shocking. It almost flew under the radar. And the unfortunate thing about industrial cyber attacks, and I'm a person who responds to industrial cyber attacks, is that a lot of them don't get reported at all. Because a lot of people don't know what to look for. They don't do forensics. And when you're talking about under-resourced utilities or places in the world where there are no cybersecurity resources, they sometimes just attribute failures to maintenance, to human error, because they have no way to find out the root cause. And then there's also a sense of embarrassment. There's still a lot of organizations out there who zealously guard the fact that they've been attacked and they've, they've suffered an incident. So there are things happening that are not visible in the news. I'll talk a little bit about that, but in this case, we almost missed it, that a steel mill, really scary sp space for a, from a, a safety perspective and a life and safety perspective, was attacked, and the attack was effective against its control systems. Of course, there was unfortunately two discrete cyber attacks against the Ukrainian power grid. In 2015, an intrusion using a more common piece of malware called Black Energy 3 was effective against the enterprise network of the Ukrainian power company. And human beings with system expertise were able to use that access, that access from the enterprise network to get into the industrial network and manually conduct an attack which did effectively cut power to a quarter million Ukrainians for about six hours. In 2016, around a year later, we saw another attack utilizing malware that could do automation of industrial attacks. In both these cases, the Ukrainian government and their cybersecurity professionals and the power professionals in Ukraine did a marvelous job of restoring services efficiently and effectively. Do not minimize this attack's capability based on the fast restoration of power after only a few hours. This was a very specialized, very skilled attack against this, these systems. The attackers obviously knew the environment, they knew which systems they were going to target, and they did a lot of damage. It was very fortunate that Ukraine was able to do good restoration and switch to manual operations. It was, it was wonderful they still had that capability and they knew how to do it. They did a marvelous job. These were tremendously targeted and efficient attacks. We even saw them destroying connectivity, destroying serial to ethernet converters so that people had to manually go to sites to restore services, destroying hard drives, etc. So it's a great credit to Ukraine that they were able to restore as fast as they could. Safety system targeting is also shocking. 
We've seen that occur as well in the Trisis um, attack. Safety systems are an important part of digital control devices. They monitor the system for conditions that would be unsafe, and they're able to shut down the process if something is going wrong. Seeing cyber attackers targeting these safety systems is shocking, blatantly unethical, but expected, unfortunately, given cyber criminals and state governments who are hostile. In 2017, we saw a piece of malware specifically targeting safety systems, triconic safety systems. This has huge implications for the future of cyber attacks against industrial systems. People are thinking of how they can evade operators knowing that there's something wrong, evade safety controls. And if you're evading safety controls, you want to hurt somebody. You, you just, you're, you're either okay with hurting somebody or you want to hurt a human being. It's really appalling, but that's where attackers have been going. Recently, we saw PipeDream, a toolkit for attacking industrial control systems. And while it was not specifically novel itself, we know based on things like Cobalt Strike and Metasploit, Mimikatz, when tools get out there that enable hackers to lower the barrier to entry to attacks, the world opens to them. So here we see a piece of pre-designed malware, a toolkit for attacking industrial control systems. That's a big problem. That is, again, lowering the bar to entry. Previously, when you were going to do a Stuxnet or a Trisis, you had to have specialized people who knew how the industrial processes worked. Or you were just hitting buttons and hoping that the safety system or a human operator wouldn't catch you and that it actually did something to the process. Automating those tasks? That is a really big problem. That is going to change the threat landscape. We also see an influx of ransomware in industrial networks. Industrial networks have to be efficient by design. That means less security controls, a ton of legacy systems. So of course, they're great targets for ransomware. And the bottom line is, criminals want to make money. States have always done sabotage and espionage. And if the low bar to entry and the easiest way to conduct those attacks is to attack digital industrial control systems, they will absolutely do that. So let's talk about where we are today. So what am I doing for a living every day? Well, all kinds of th everything. Again, my, my, my life is an episode of how stuff works every day. I'm in different verticals, different eras of technology. I'm Windows, Windows NT one day and Windows 11 the next day. But I can divide the cases I work into three general categories. The first one is, of course, the ransomware commodity malware space. Again, criminals have figured out that these systems are less protected and they're a really good target and they have huge consequences. Remember the word I want you to go with, away with today is consequences. People are willing to pay up a lot of times when their systems are ransomed. It's very unfortunate. So they're becoming a bigger target for ransomware. Insider threats. Yeah, I just mentioned, yeah, to, to really do something specific and kinetic to industrial systems, you need a lot of system expertise, but do you know who has a lot of system expertise? The people who work on the systems. And insiders aren't always intentional. They're not always trying to do bad things. Sometimes they just want to watch Netflix. If they're on the night shift in the industrial facility and they want to watch Netflix, and so they plug in an antenna or something. It happens. It happens all the time. So intentional and unintentional insiders. And finally, state adversaries. Again, spies are going to spy. They're going to steal secrets. They're going to cause purposeful sabotage and damage to industrial processes. They always have wanted to do that. This is just a more effective way to do it. So what's going on in these networks? Why aren't they more secure? Well, there is an awareness of cyber threats. These operators do know, for the most part, that that is a problem, that there are threats out there, and they're concerned about them. But a lot of industrial utilities, especially, are incredibly under-resourced. It depends on the country you're in. In the United States, a lot of our water and sewage is municipal. And those run on a shoestring. They have maybe one IT person, much less a cybersecurity person. Well, on the other side, you see oil and gas companies that have many more resources, potentially. Manufacturing. People manufacture on a shoestring with a tiny margin. 
They also hardly ever have dedicated cybersecurity resources. Or if they do, they're tiny, and they're not capable of doing a whole lot because they just don't have the people and the money. Regulation is haphazard all over the world. Uh, there's some industrial spaces like electric where you see some cybersecurity regulation, but not a ton. And in other verticals, it's almost non-existent. People are trying, but when nobody has resources, it's very challenging to put laws in place about reporting and cybersecurity. There are a lot of faulty assumptions and miscommunications between IT and process environments. The staffs oftentimes butt heads. They oftentimes hate each other. They don't talk. There's shadow IT going on. Because there's been so much miscommunication about priorities and technologies and how these industrial environments work. Again, your operators care about consequences. They always have. They care about them whether they're caused by maintenance problems or cyber. They don't care. They care about consequences, whatever causes them. They, ca they care about people dying. And if you are not speaking that language to them, if you're talking about, oh yeah, you got some configure out there, they don't care if there's configure on their network. Is it gonna kill somebody? What consequence is it going to cause? We have to have a drastic shift in thinking as cybersecurity people to work in these industrial cybersecurity environments. In terms of us as industrial cybersecurity professionals, I probably know everybody who does my job. There's probably less than 100 of us out there in the world. We are very under-resourced in terms of tools and people, people who understand industrial and also understand cybersecurity. That's why I'm shilling this to you right now. I want you to be involved in it. We need more people. We need more tools. We are dealing with many eras of technology across many verticals. It's a huge landscape. We need forensics tools. We need technology. We need security tools that actually work in these process environments. So what are some of the challenges that I'm facing on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, first of all, I always have to be thinking about those consequences. Is what I'm doing as an investigator potentially going to cause a worse consequence than what the adversary is doing? If I run my forensic collection tool, is it going to bring down the process because I'm running it on a NT system with 16 megs of RAM? I don't know. I have to know that. I have to find that out. That has to be part of my decision-making process. Does this computer even have USB ports? Is it running an embedded operating system that I've never seen before and I'm going to have to reverse engineer? That's the kind of space I work in. And I have to know those things because these systems are sensitive and they are doing life-critical things. There's a ton of legacy. Now, I talked about IT, OT convergence, but the differ space is diverging. It's getting really different because there's no XDR, EDR in these industrial environments. Again, you might see Windows NT out there. You might see Windows XP embedded. Your tools don't necessarily run on these systems, and if they do run, they could, they could cause an impact to the process because there's not enough system resources. I'm also dealing with the low-level devices, like the PLCs, the, sens the sensors, the actuators. Those look very different than traditional computers, and I might have to do forensics on them. So I mentioned this divergence. It makes it very, very challenging for me to hire people because most of the people who are coming out of forensic and cybersecurity curriculums today have a heavy reliance on these modern tools that do so much of forensics for them. And I love XDR. I love EDR. I love our modern security tooling. It's wonderful. And we don't have any of it in OT. We can't. So that means if the entire college curriculum has been based around these modern tools and not doing traditional old school forensics from 2000, they're going to have a big challenge in learning those skills to get caught up. And I don't necessarily even know if they'll be comfortable thinking about things in that legacy way. So it's very challenging to hire people right now as well because nobody's getting that traditional forensic training anymore. There's a heavy focus on bugs in these systems when the real concern is always the holistic process. Again, the consequences of concern. I see a lot of people who buy a PLC and they're like, it's vulnerable. Like, heck yeah, it's vulnerable. It's made to receive a command and respond. It's made to do the process efficiently and safely and quickly. If you start adding encryption and security controls to those devices, whoo. What if it adds a one second delay to the system and that's the stop button on the wall? That could mean somebody dies. These systems are made to be simple. 
I often say that you have, in these industrial environments, a crispy candy outside, we hope, and a soft, gooey candy inside. Once you're in there, these systems are pretty vulnerable by design because they have to be simple and effective. So you have to find other ways to protect them with an outside candy shell. You have to use segmentation, you have to use network architecture, detection, access control, vulnerability management to control the threats that are going to impact potentially these sensitive industrial systems. So bugs, okay, yeah, yeah, these, these devices are vulnerable. And I'm glad people are doing that research, that's nice, it's important to know, but like, yeah, they're vulnerable once you get in there. So the real cybersecurity solutions we have to build are holistic. They involve the whole picture of the process and the process consequences and all of these control loops. That's what we have to actually build. And that means we have to understand the environment really well. We also have to understand what assets we have in place. So low-level devices, higher-level computers, networking, how they fit into our process, what's a crown jewel, et cetera. We have to make sure that we build secure architecture to shield these sensitive process devices. We have to do good vulnerability manage to management to know where we have potential vectors for attack. And we also have to do a lot of relationship repair. If you have industrial environments in your organization and this is meeting anything to you right now, get a box of bagels or donuts, some coffee, go sit down with your industrial engineers and operators and restart that dialogue. Because you are never going to be able to do cybersecurity well if you have an unhealthy relationship between your operators and engineers and you. You have to start fixing that. They know more about these processes and consequences than you ever will. You have to have a dialogue about that to do effective cybersecurity and incident response at all. And that means a lot of preparation. You have to do separate, discrete incident response planning for these environments. It's a big deal. It's very challenging. It's very different. Obviously, our incident response plan in these environments has to be discrete. Doing forensics is different. You contact different people. Your priorities and your risk management are different in incident response in these environments. It is not the same. You're doing forensics on legacy devices. So you have to think about all of those things in terms of business continuity and disaster planning for incident response, cybersecurity incident response for your OT environments. We have to rely heavily on passive monitoring and detection because, again, these systems are super sensitive. You can't just go out and run a vulnerability scan against them. You could crash these systems. They might have very simple legacy protocol stacks. They might not be able to handle a packet that's malformed. They might just crash. And again, life and safety, real consequences if you crash those devices. So a lot of what we have to do in these environments is very passive monitoring and detection. So we have to go back in our time machine, back to 2000 again, and start thinking about those cybersecurity technologies and forensics tools we used to rely on. And everything, everything, everything has to come down to a word. What's that word? Everybody say it with me. Consequences. Oh, oh look at you. How nice. It's the morning and you, you actually did it. Consequences, everyone. If you want to be in this space, if you want to interact with people in this space, everything needs to come back to what is the worst day ever in this process environment and what can cause that. It might not be digital. It might be something else, but we care about the digital things that can cause those consequences. And if we're going to have discussions with the operators, we have to be able to speak to things in terms of the consequences that they care about and we should care about too. It's really important. The near future for us, um, the operational technology or the process environment workforce, a lot of them are retiring right now, like many other fields working with legacy technologies. We are having a great brain drain in industrial cybersecurity because a lot of the people who know these systems really well, especially the legacy systems, are on their way out. They're retiring. I talked about this divergence of skills, too. This is a really big challenge. The people coming out of school, out of security operations centers, who we want to hire and we want to have do this industrial cybersecurity work are not learning essential old school forensic and incident response tactics and tools. And so we have to find people who we can teach those skills. And that's a long process sometimes, learning how to do old school hard drive forensics, like on old school 1990s hard drives. But here, not learning that in college. I know a lot of people in this audience know how to do it. Start teaching people. 
please start teaching people because that skill is going away. I mentioned that we have a lot of space to grow into in terms of tool development. If you're like, hey, this sounds really cool and really important and I want to build a tool, oh my god. I love you, first of all, I love you. Think about all the different verticals that have industrial technologies. I named a ton. All of manufacturing, transportation, utilities, oil and gas, water, sewage, electric. Different verticals, different manufacturers of industrial technologies in all those spaces. And then you have like 35 years of those technologies in all those spaces. All those discrete computing devices need forensic tools. Pretty scary, eh? You have plenty of space to be helpful and useful. You have plenty of space to build tools for industrial cybersecurity. We need people doing that. Otherwise, everything is a manual, painstaking reverse engineering game. The barrier of entry to attacks keeps lowering. Like I mentioned, we saw the Pipe Dream Toolkit, which was a pre-made toolkit for attacking a set of industrial devices. That's going to keep happening. Again, we're seeing more and more ransomware. Attackers know this does important stuff. People are willing to pay up because they desperately need their utilities to work or to keep their manufacturing line working. So these attacks are effective. Even if they aren't causing kinetic process problems, just having ransomware in the computers that display the status of your system means you might have to shut down the process because you don't know if it's running safely. So yeah, it might not be making something explode if you get ransomware in your industrial network, but if you can't see what's going on, if it's running safely anymore, then what do you have to do? You have to go hit the big red button on the wall because you don't know if somebody's going to be injured or killed or whether your devices are going to be damaged. You don't know. So the barrier to entry on these, these attacks is lowering and attackers are getting more effective at causing damage, causing consequences to industrial control networks. And that's tied to the global economy too. We know things aren't great. They aren't going to be great for a while in the global economy right now. And that is driving more cyber attacks. That's driving more efficient cyber attacks. Commodity crimeware groups, they operate like businesses. They're looking for efficiencies. They're looking for how they can cause the most damage possible. So, of course, they're getting more effective on choosing their targets, and a really effective, efficient target is unfortunately, unethically, utilities, industrial systems, the things that keep our lights on, the things that keep our supply chains running, the things that keep our water safe to drink. We need you. I hope I've reached a small number of you at least today. I hope I've made you excited about this and engaged. I hope I've at least taught you the word consequences, it's very, very important so that you can go have conversations with you or your industrial personnel, like your operators and your engineers. If you're a leader, if you're a leader in cybersecurity, you need to start thinking about what industrial environments you have. And you don't have to be making widgets in a manufacturing facility. You don't have to work for a utility. Do you have building automation controls? Do you have data center heating and cooling? That's all industrial processes. Do you have logistics? We need buy-in from the leaders out there in the cybersecurity space. People need to be thinking about these industrial environments, fixing the relationships, building healthy relationships, and getting those teams the resources they need to do better cybersecurity. Practitioners, technical practitioners out there, we need you to start paying attention to the industrial environments, not just going, oh, I don't want to touch that. Sorry, you got to dive in there. Get your box of bagels, get your box of donuts, Go sit and ask questions of your engineers. Bribery is wonderful. Just bring them some food and be polite and try to learn a little bit more about these environments because they need to be secured. And we've been doing it wrong all this time. Researchers, again, I mentioned we need tools. We need tools. We need lots of forensics tools, detection tools, analysis tools for all these different technologies from different eras. There's tons of research potential that's very, very meaningful. And for everybody else who's just an informed citizen and a person who votes in your country, think about the legislation that's going into place for these things. Are you just legislating without providing resources? Are you just telling the operators and engineers to do more stuff without giving them the tools to do it? Are you making sure that there's possibilities for good tooling, good reporting? 
These are important issues, and there's a lot of problems to solve. And I really want you to be engaged in these issues going forward. With that, my time is up. I've had a short time today to try to get you engaged in this problem. I'd love to talk to you more about it. I'd love to hear your questions, concerns. If you'd like to reach out to me, I'm Hacks for Pancakes on pretty much everything. I've also got my email address here. I would love to talk to you more. I think we have a couple minutes for some questions, though, if anybody would like to ask some questions. Uh, yes, sir. Is there a, a microphone that people can use? Uh, yes, they're standing in the middle of the room. If you'd like to use the microphone so the people online can hear your question. Thanks for the talk. I have a very simple question. What is the difference in doing instance response in this space compared to kind of traditional we investigate a hacked server space? Yeah, so it's usually the consequences. So um, again, one of my primary concerns in this investigation is first of all, what's my priority? Is it just getting the system up and running safely? Or is it actually knowing what's happened? I have to ask people that in incident response in industrial. It's not a matter of, in, inter, in enterprise, I have the luxury of saying, well, I'm going to go do some malware analysis. I'm going to do some forensics on systems. I'm going to understand the attack path. I have to ask, because the priority for people to not die in that environment might be, it has to be up and running safely tomorrow. Or in 16 hours, it has to be up and running safely. So priorities, based on those consequences. And then, of course, all of the legacy systems and then making sure that my tools and actions do not impact the process. That's challenging. What else? Uh, my name is Doug. Uh, thank you for the talk, by the way. I work in the food industry, and we have a lot of ICS systems from vendors like ABB, Rockwell, Honeywell, Siemens. Of course. Do you have any hints or tips for how we in ITOT, um, along with the business, uh, the technicians can interact with the vendors to inspire them to do <laughs> their part and cooperating with us? It's challenging. Some of the vendors are more receptive than others. There is vendors that are doing wonderful cybersecurity research, and they are very, very interactive with cybersecurity research co communities and companies. And there's others who hide everything on, behind lawyers. So it depends on your vendor. Understand your reporting relationship. Make sure that bug reporting and security vulnerability disclosure are written into your contracts, if possible. Try to build a relationship with their security team if you can. Try to find out who those contacts are. And if you have a research team internally, don't be afraid to send them reports. Now have your lawyers look over them first, because again, some of these com companies are very, very touchy about vulnerability reports. It's Again, we're going back in the time machine to 2000. The bug bounty programs aren't really there for those industrial companies. So, Good relationships is a place to start, and just understand that some companies are going to be more receptive than others. Hey, Leslie. Um, Rissa from Cisco Meraki. I had a question. Um, I really like to talk about the brain drain and stuff, right? And so, have you seen, uh, while we're losing more and more people who have that background in defending, have you seen attackers leveraging AI? to scrape all that information on these systems that nobody knows how to attack anymore, where we used to say acceptable risk, because nobody can remember how to attack them anymore, to now attack the systems. So AI, I believe that was the beginning of the question. Um, I have seen it lower the bar to entry to doing things like writing ladder, ladder logic for systems. Uh, your chat GPT and such can write code for these industrial systems, because it's very well documented in most cases. So if you wanted to conduct a attack and you needed a specific way to interact with a specific industrial device, it can lower the barrier to entry for that. Thank you for, first of all, thank you for the contribution you've done to the community. Thank you so much. Of course. Uh, BB from CertilV and NIST. Two weeks ago, Mundian released Cosmic Energy, uh, the analysis of the malware for the OT networks. What is your personal evaluation and take on this? Ooh. <laughs> it was interesting. It doesn't have my hair on fire. It, it, I, there's, been, there's been a lot of interesting proof of concepts out there. And what it tells you in the overall picture, just like Pipe Dream, is that people are thinking about this space more, and they're trying to lower the barrier to entry. The individual attacks aren't all, always 
incredibly interesting on their own because they can be very specialized, very targeted, not very practical. But what they show us is that there is a community of interest on the black hat side in doing bad things. Hello. Um, so since uh, IR and OT is different than IT, do you have any, uh, any good pointers to uh, best practices out there to, uh, to people that are getting into the field? Uh, how to learn about it, you mean? Uh, since I'm, I'm just thinking there's a lot of guidance on the IR process mm. in general, so I was thinking if there's anything similar to, to OT out there that, uh, that you could point to. So the best blog out there on learning, and I think this is unfortunately the last question we have time for, but um, the best blog out there on resources to learn about OT security was written by our CEO, Rob Lee. It's on his personal blog, and he has a long reference page of resources for learning about OT cybersecurity that he keeps adding to. Um, other than that, there's, of course, paid training through SANS, et cetera, but there's not a ton out there. Uh, there's, there's not a lot of resources. That's why we need people so desperately. Thank you so very much, though. I think we're out of time. I really am grateful for your hospitality. I'll be out in the hallway if you want to ask some more questions, but I encourage you to stay for SPAF's talk, which is going to be fantastic, which is the next upcoming talk. Thank you so much.